Well, look, happy birthday, church, for yesterday and today, Mary, mother of the church, the most influential woman to have ever lived. Mary, the mother of God, who we honor in our church's tradition in a very special way today, the first day after Pentecost. But I have an amazing panel today that I am honored to host on behalf of the 1010 Conference. He needs no introduction because he's been with you all morning. But another shout out, big round of applause for Jason Everett. I'm also very, very honored to introduce all of you to Laura Neeson, a proud wife and mother, family educator, and general manager of the Arintech program. Round of applause for Laura Neeson. Now this young man is larger than life. You may not look at his stature, but he has the most amazing personality. He's got a smile that just lights up a room. Say hello to Joseph, everyone. And on the end, last but certainly not least, the beautiful Emily. Round of applause for Emily. So, what I've been doing the last couple of years with 1010 and around high school chaplains here all over Sydney is really listening to students and what's on your hearts. Because ultimately, you guys have a lot of questions. And the harsh reality is, sometimes those questions are not addressed. We go looking for answers, and because those questions are not addressed, the answers are addressed in the wrong way. We go looking for them, we see things that will trend on TikTok, trend on Instagram, and we just as a million people like it, it must be true. So we get our sources of information. So we have the great opportunity now, in the limited time we have, we've got about half an hour, we're going to get into some of the questions that have been submitted by you, the students, as a population over the last couple of years. We'll cover what we can, and if we don't finish everything, Jason, Charbel, myself, and my co-host, Anthony, will be shooting a podcast this afternoon on Against the Grain, and we're going to get into the questions, all the other questions. So, a bit of a cheap plug for myself. Like, subscribe, comment, follow, and it'll be dropped on Wednesday. So, we're going to get into all of that. That's the Against the Grain podcast, where Father is in a Catholic priest, and son, not my biological son, talk faith and footy. And any Bulldog supporters in the crowd tonight? Not a Bulldog. Not a Bulldog. It's terrible. It's okay. We're coming, we're coming for all of you. We're coming for all of you. What I want to do right now, what I want to do right now is introduce our first question. Who's asking that one? Joseph, you go for it, buddy. Is a consenting sexual relationship outside of marriage healthy? Jason. Uh, the, the question was, is a consenting sexual relationship outside of marriage healthy? Um, what makes something healthy is not the fact that you consent to it. That's, that's making ourselves God. As long as I'm okay with this, then it becomes good. I don't have that kind of authority to basically just say something is good and it becomes good. When you look at the word healthy, okay, okay, is it spiritually healthy? No, it's, it's not getting as close to God. Is it physically healthy? Uh, well, no, you can get these STDs, pregnancy, things like that. Okay, is this emotionally healthy? To get this close to somebody when they're not your spouse, especially from the girl's perspective, that's super scary. It's almost like you're taking a plane up to 30,000 feet, and there, there's no parachute. You have this massive level of investment, and if that thing falls, the, the wreckage is going to be disastrous. And so that's why a lot of girls will give a guy something physical, thinking, okay, this is show him how much he needs to make, and then after a week or a month, the guy says, nah, I'm not interested. For her, the, the wreckage is a mess emotionally. The levels of depression go up. And so to me, it's like, okay, what is love? Love means I'm doing what's best for this other person. And can I really say in the depths of my heart that sleeping with a woman who's not my wife is doing what's best for her? No, all I'm doing is what feels good to me. My devotion is not to her, my devotion is to my own pleasure. And I'll, I'll say or do whatever I need to do to get her to say yes so I can get that thing. That's not love, it's manipulation. 
And so imagine if there was a high school guy, and he's dating this girl, and she's beautiful, and he wants to be close to her, emotionally, physically, spiritually, but he realized if I sleep with her tonight, you know, man, she'd have to lie to her parents about it, and if she gets pregnant, her parents are gonna freak out, it's gonna ruin our relationship, and as much as I'd like to be physically close to her, you know what, tonight, I'm not going to, because I wanna fall in love with her for all the right reasons, and my abstinence tonight with her is gonna be a better expression than making love, because I'm doing what's best for her. You can see, man, that guy really loves that woman. He doesn't love her as a good for himself, he actually wants what's good for her. That's the mark of authentic human love. And so the church is not against love. The reason this whole thing is being set up today to, is to free you to love. Because if I can't even say no to my sexual desires, saying yes to them means nothing. And so chastity frees you to love, and it frees you to know if you're authentically being loved as well. So I'm Amazing, amazing, amazing. Laura. Thank you both for answering that. And maybe just as the, as the priest on the panel, the relationship that you should be consenting to is to God. Jesus never asked you to do something that would make you feel uncomfortable, unloved, unimportant. That's the relationship that you and I are called to consent to every day. And the way we do that is by opening up our hearts to God in prayer. Give him everything. Give him your vulnerability. Give him what you're hurting with. And say, God, things aren't going well for me now. I've done things in my life I might not be proud of, but help me change my heart. And that's a relationship that I will consent to every single day. So I encourage all of you to do the same. One challenge I'd extend specifically to the guys is a lot of guys have a mentality that as long as she's willing to do it, then we're good. And I won't force you to do anything, but if you say yes, then we're gonna go ahead and do that thing. Understand guys, it's not her job to be your chastity cop. It's not her job to tell you no. It's our job as men never to put her in a situation where she'd need to say no to us to begin with. Because you could be getting physical with a girl and it might seem like her body is saying yes because she's verbally not saying no. And, and you might think, okay, she's not saying no. Okay, things are moving forward. In her brain, she could be thinking this. Okay, it is nice to feel close and wanted like this, but I feel like things are taking off too physically too fast. And I wish things would slow down, but I feel like if I'm the one who tells him to get his hands down or not do this, it's gonna get really awkward. All of this could be spinning in her mind while you're thinking she's not saying no. And so please understand, just because a girl's not saying no doesn't mean that, that she's all on board with this. So your job is not to make her your chastity cop. Your job is to never put her in a situation where she'd ever have to say no to you in the first place. Because then you're being a true gentleman instead of leaving it on her to tame your sexual desires. That's not her job. So. Amazing. Amazing, next question. Why should we say no to sexual advances? Um, because you wanna say yes to authentic love. That's all it comes down to. Chastity is not this prolonged no, 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 no. Why do we say no to lust? Because I want to be free to love. It's not because sex is bad. I mean, who invented sex? The devil? No, this is God's idea. And so if someone is making sexual advances to you, the question comes up. Does this person want me or does this person want the pleasure they get from me? It makes you feel wanted. It really does. It's almost like a cigarette. Think of cigarette smokers. They don't want cigarettes. They don't. What they want is the feeling they get from the nicotine in the cigarette. And then when the cigarette runs out of nicotine, what happens? You just flick it to the gutter because it's never what you wanted to begin, to begin with. What you wanted was the feeling you extracted from it. That's how lust works. It makes you feel wanted until the other person gets what they desire and then you're just disposed of because you were not the object of their desire. Pleasure was the object of desire. And so the reason we're saying no to lust is just to say yes to love. So think of your future husband or wife out there right now. What if they were, I remember talking to these junior high girls, and American junior high is grades seven and eight, so it's like 12, 13 year old girls. And these 
three or four, you know, seventh grade girls came up and said, Jason, okay, here's the situation. Um, you know, is it okay for us to go to parties and hook up with different boys at the parties and make out with them? I'm like, okay, they're 12 years old. I said, okay, let's say the boy you're gonna marry doesn't go to that party or to that junior high. Let's say the boy you're gonna marry goes across the street to that public school, and right now, he's with an eighth grade cheerleader girl who wants to hook up and make out with him. I go, what do you think about that other girl who's with your future husband right now? And she was like, I'd kick her butt. And I'm like, easy, tiger. She wanted her future husband to be pure for her, and so my challenge, just give to your future spouse that same gift. I don't need a bunch of memories of other women to bring into the bedroom in my marriage. I'm, I'm glad, I, I did get married as a virgin, yes, but I did other stupid stuff, pornography, and I needed healing from those memories. So give not just your body to your future husband or wife, give your heart, give your mind, give the whole thing. And that's what it's about. If then when someone asks you, well, why aren't you having sex? I'm like, well, I just wanna be faithful to my wife before I even meet the woman. How are they gonna argue with that? It's about loving the person even before you've met the person. when I was younger and I was dating and um, I was really excited because my boyfriend said to me, he said, I've got a really important question to ask you. And I was like, wow, what's he going to say? And he said, will you move in with me? And I responded and said, oh, I need to think about that. And I took it to my sister who we call Saint Philomena because she's a saint. And I said, this is what's happened. He's asked me to move in with him. And Mina said to me, I will never forget this. It sounds a bit crass, but she said, why would he buy the cow if he can have the milk for free? <laughs> so I was like, oh yeah. So I said no. I said no to that. I said no to that lifestyle because I wanted something more. I wanted, I wanted the works. I wanted marriage. And so I was prepared to wait for that. And I might just piggyback onto that question for a moment because it seems as though it's almost like the cultural norm. Jason, you spoke earlier about how the culture is just so hypersexualized. It's the normal thing to do. You get a boyfriend, you get a girlfriend. Well, have you kissed yet? Have you done this yet? Have you done that yet? And I know what it's like, because I've been in playgrounds myself. Everyone talks. Everyone talks about it. Oh, you've been with him for a month. You haven't done this yet. What advice can you give to those guys? Yeah. Well, for one, I think we, I want to be careful that we're not putting it all on the guys. You know, the guys, the ones pressuring the girls. We know in today's culture, these things are going in both directions. And so the reason to say no to sexual advances and moving these things too fast, I remember one girl, she came back from a date and she was crying. And her mom said to her, well, what happened? She was this college girl, university, and she said, I got in the car with the guy for our first date. And he started to make these little sexual jokes of what he wanted to do with me. And she told him, no, no, I, I practice chastity. And he said, that's okay. There's lots of other stuff we can do, meaning everything but intercourse. And she said, I don't think you understand. I respect God, my body, my future husband. And he looked at her and he said, so you mean I'm not gonna get anything tonight? She said, no. He said, okay. He turned the car around, drove her home, dumped her off, and, she, and he left. And she's never seen him again. And you know what? Thank God. Because she could have given that to him for six months. Does he love me? Is he in it for the right reasons? She didn't play those games. On date number one, these are my morals. If you don't respect them, go home. And that's exactly where he went. And so this is why chastity is the guardian of love. It frees you to know if you're authentically being loved and not simply being used. How does one find a bo boyfriend slash girlfriend? How do you find a boyfriend, girlfriend? Um, well, right now the question is, okay, is now the best time for a boyfriend, girlfriend? And what I would say is this, uh, imagine a grid with four boxes. Right here, let's say you're a guy, this is the right girl for you and it's the right time to date her. In this little box over here, is this the right girl, but it's not the right time to date. And then down here, it's the wrong girl to date and it's the wrong time to date and the wrong girl, right time. So imagine those four grids. Okay, where do you find yourself right now? Maybe I feel like I found this right girl, but the question is, is it the right time to date? Because even if she is awesome, well, great, she could go to university in Perth, and then you might go to the university in Adelaide, and then she's gonna get a job in Melbourne, and then you could get a job in Sydney, and before you know it, you're gonna have this long distance, four year relationship, while she's meeting 20,000 college guys on the other side of the country for the next four years. Is this really the right time to date? Honestly, probably not. And so what I would say, instead of focusing on finding your soulmate right now, find yourself right now. 
Okay, God, what do you want for me to do with my life? What are my passions? What are my desires? And then it, when it comes to the time to find the right person, go where the good people are. Get involved in service work or church or pro-life activities. Find people that would be passionate about the things that matter to you. And instead of like running all the time, is she the one, is that the one, is this the one, is that one? No, no, no. Instead of that, focus on God and run as fast as you can towards him. And then after a while of running, I want you to look beside you and see who's keeping up with you. That's the kind of person you want to end up with, that you both have the same goal of closeness to God. Because the closer you get to God, the more you can love that other person. And so right now, don't be anxious about finding your future boyfriend, girlfriend. My high school's a thousand students. I think two of them ended up getting married out of like a thousand people, you know? And so to realize, okay, the future is gonna go way beyond the four walls of your school. This isn't like I said during the talk, the time to find a husband, it's more time to find the bridesmaid. And so right now, just get to know yourself, get to know God, and then I think college, university life, that's a better time to focus on romantic relationships. So, and by doing that, you're focusing on the foundation of love, which is friendship. A lot of the conversations I had out in that field out there ended up coming back to this idea of friendship. Think of it like concrete underneath a skyscraper. That's friendship under romantic love. You can't just build romantic love right away. There's no foundation. Focus on the friendship. Because I'm telling you, if you get married to someone other than your best friend, good luck with that. Because look, you could have like passion without friendship, but you can't have intimacy without friendship. I want you to marry your best friend. Friendship is the core of marital love. And so right now, you don't have to wait for friendship. Dive right in. Learn to relate to guys. Is this guy, why am I so attracted to this guy? Is it because he's cute and he smells nice and he has fun? Like, why am I really drawn to this guy? Ask yourself these questions. Does he share your morality or does he just kind of like respect and tolerate your morality? Likewise, guys, why are you so attracted to that girl? What if every girl in Australia looked exactly like she does what is it about her that would have drawn you to her? Does she bring out the best in you? Do you admire her virtue? Get to be attracted to more than just the physical features if you want that relationship to truly last. So, best place to find a boyfriend, girlfriend. Uh, I, <laughs> he's taking the words out of my mouth before I speak them. He does but, that, okay. also. He does that. <laughs> um, yeah, everything you said is right. I, I had this conversation recently with my son and he's starting to think about boyfriend, uh, girlfriends, sorry, not boyfriends, girlfriends. And um, we rephrased it and we said, well, how about we're not, we're not calling them girlfriends, we're calling them girls who are friends. And we're focusing on friendship right now because um, he doesn't have the, the um, he's not, he's not um, experienced enough to understand you know, how to have a romantic relationship. And what, what I want him to do is to focus on friendship. And um, I think what you said is so important that you, you need to marry someone who has fallen in love with Jesus. If you do that, that's safe. That's, you, you know that if, if God is first in your relationship, that they're going to love you the way Jesus loves you. And that's so important in life. That's beautifully said and very, very accurate. Date with intention. When you get to that age, date with intention. You're not dating to muck around. You're not dating to just wait for the next best thing to come along. Date with intention. Can I see this man as my husband? Can I see this woman as my wife? If the answer to that is no, then do not waste your time. It'll save you a lot of heartache, trust me. I've been there. I'm a Catholic priest now, <laughs> which is good. But date with intention, so important. Yeah, and, and if you're single, be single. Try not to be that halfway point between boyfriend, girlfriend, and single, where you're almost like emotionally dating, but you don't have the title to it. It's really hard. So the idea is, look, girls, if you're not his, if you're not his girlfriend, don't behave like his girlfriend. If you are his girlfriend, don't behave like his wife. And if you are his wife, live as one. And would you imagine if guys would just do the same thing, how much simpler relationships would be? But a lot of times it's easier to have custody over your body than it is over your heart. And that's the challenging time, when it's not yet time to date, but you want to date and your heart is kind of running ahead of you. Uh, I'll tell this one story that I think kind of encapsulates this. There was a high school couple that I had read about. They had an awesome relationship. It was pure, God was in the middle of it, but it was getting really intense emotionally. And the girl's dad approached the guy and he said, son, could I go for a, a ride with you? I'd like to talk to you. And the boy's like, okay, they get in the car, they start driving. And the dad's like, what is this I hear about you having such strong feelings for my daughter? And the boy's like, oh, sir, your daughter is like the most amazing girl on earth and I could totally see myself marrying her one day. 
And the dad said, you know what? I agree. She is the most amazing girl. But I would rather right now her just focus on schoolwork, friends, sports, than being like in this intense, emotional, committed relationship. So if you guys could just kind of scale it back and be friends, I'd really appreciate that. And the guy was kind of heartbroken, but he saw the wisdom of what the dad was saying. And he gets back to the house, and the girl's like, what did my dad talk to you about? And he told her. And so they were at a crossroads. Okay, what do we do? Do we keep dating and hide behind your dad's back, or do we get just kind of like break up and just be friends? And they decided to keep dating behind the guy's back, the dad's back. But it was really gnawing at their conscience. And the guy said to the girl eventually, I can't keep doing this. I really respect your dad. And if he found out that I was lying to him, that would really ruin my relationship with him, your relationship with me, your relationship with him. We got to come clean. But before they told the dad the truth, he caught them in a lie and the whole thing was ruined. And it was a mess. And, and the guy said to the dad, look, I can't just be friends with your daughter. If I can't have her as a girlfriend, I don't know how to have her in my life. And the dad said, look, if you don't know how to relate to my daughter as a friend, it might be a sign that you're not even ready to date her. And so they said goodbye. And she gave back to him all the love letters he had ever written to her, more than 100 pages of love letters. And in, he gave them back in love. And then they just said goodbye. But that night, he came back to her house. And while everyone was asleep, he dug a hole in her front lawn and he buried in it a shoebox filled with all those love letters. And then he covered it with dirt and leaves and he just prayed. And he said, God, you know my heart. And if there's any man on earth that can love her better than I can love her, I want him for her. But God, if I'm that man, please change her father's heart. And he left and he went off to college. A year went by, two years went by. They had no contact with each other. And then his phone rings and it's the girl's dad. And the dad said, hi, son, do you remember me? And the guy's like, yeah, I remember you. He, the dad said, look, th the mark that you left on my family, that you let go of my daughter, when I know that she meant the world to you because you trusted that I wanted what was best for her and you stuck by your word, he said, that took a lot of integrity and a lot of character and grit, and I honor that. And you know what? It, if you ever want to date my daughter, I think she'd be more of willing and happy. And the guy was thrilled. He called the girl up. They started dating each other. They dated for a year and a half. And on Christmas morning, he had a little box to give her. And she's all excited, oh, it's an engagement ring. And she opens the box and it says red maple tree. And she's like, what? And he's like, yeah, I thought you'd like a tree. And she's like, well, thanks for the tree. And he says, yeah, why don't we go plant the tree? And she says, no, it's freezing outside. I wanna go in the snow and plant a tree. And the guy's like, no, I think we should plant the tree. And she said, it's too cold. He said, I think we should plant the tree. And he's like, okay, plant the tree, the control freak. So they go outside, he pulls a shovel out of the dad's garage. And he said, I think this would be a good place to plant our tree. And he starts digging at the spot where he had buried the box years earlier. And he uncovered the box and then he handed to her the final love letter that she had never read before because he wrote it that night and it was his marriage proposal to her. And then on bended knee, he asked her to be his bride. Today, these two are married and raising a family together. This is proof God honors those who honor him. So it's a pretty cool story. So go on to the next one. So I heard, take, take your time, trust your parents. I heard the, the gasp in the crowd, that one cut to the hearts of people, but it's true, it happens. It happens, it's worth being patient. Um, will we ever find a person who won't want us just for sex? Will you ever find someone who won't want you just for sex? Do you want to start with that one or you want me? Sure. Uh, yes. <laughs> Absolutely yes. Um, when the time is right and when you've done all the work you need to do to get to know yourself and, and to have a relationship with God. And it's more about where are you looking for that love as well. So, you know, Finding someone who's already fallen in love with Jesus, I think there's nothing more attractive than that. And so have friends who, who have faith. Um, let them, let the, the person you fall in love with eventually be the one that leads you closer to Christ. I think that should be your goal. Yeah, and you think of the question, will you ever find someone who loves you not just for the sex? If that's all they love you for, then it's not even love to begin with. And a life of singleness would be far preferable to a life of being used by somebody else. And so in particular, girls, you have a womanly intuition that tells you when there's a red flag. You need to learn to listen to that, especially listen to your female friends who love you, your family members who love you. And they're telling you, this dude is bad news, stay away. Listen to those voices because you doubt yourself way too much. And so if a guy or girl just wants you for the physical stuff, Remember, it's not you that they want. If a guy won't stay with you because you won't give him something physical, then it really proves, okay, it's not me he wants. Because if he really wants me, he can have me without the sex. 
But if he wants sex and, and I won't give it to him, and he, then he can't have me because that's all that he's after in the first place. And so it's a real test of love. But be careful because if you tell a guy, we're not doing that or we're not doing that anymore after today, you're going to get one of three reactions. Either he's a jerk about it. What? We can't do that anymore? What do you like? Like some other guy? Are you some prude? Are you going to become a nun? Like They're trying like this emotional mental manipulation or they'll get pouty or whiny or petulant or distant or angry or unfaithful. They're trying to emotionally manipulate you to get physical gratification. That's the bad reaction. He's, he's a jerk about it. If that's the reaction, just get the heck out and don't go back. Second reaction is he acts like he's okay with it. Okay, I respect that if that's what you want to do. But then two weeks later, it's back to the same old stuff. Well, can we at least do this? Can we at least do that? He's just waiting for you to cave in. It's almost like teaching a dog to balance a bone on their nose. You can do it and they'll stare at it until you say the yes and then they'll take it. That's not the kind of guy you want to be with. You want a guy who realizes, hey, guess what? Girls have temptations too. And so we need to have, hold each other accountable. So if she's tempted, he can be strong. And when he's tempted, she can be strong. To me, that's a healthy relationship. We're in this together, calling each other on to practice virtue, as opposed to he tries to get away with whatever he wants, and it's her job to just slap his hand and say no. To me, that's using. It's not authentically loving. So I really, my hope and prayer for you is yes, you can find a relationship like that. But my goal is, look where you're looking. Are you spending a bunch of time on social media? <laughs> you're not going to find Mr. Wonderful, you know, on, on, on TikTok and all these random people that message you on Instagram. No, no, no. Unplug from that stuff. Your anxiety level will be almost the same as your social media level. The more social media, the more anxiety. That's the way it works. Unplug a little bit, get involved in youth group at your church, get involved where the good people are, and you realize, wait a minute, there's some really decent human beings out there because there's some really good guys out there. So don't give up on men. If you're losing hope as a woman, please don't give up on us guys. A lot of us think, well, we, if we don't try this stuff with you, you won't think we're that much of a man. Now, let's just be the men and women that God are calling us to be and let him figure out the right time for us to meet each other. Well, thank you, Jason, for that wonderful answer. Laura, for your time also, and for our beautiful students, Joseph and Emily, thank you so much. I would encourage, I would encourage all of us here this afternoon, this is the start of a journey. It's a lot to process, what you've heard this morning. So I need us to be patient, to open up our minds and our hearts, to think about this, to pray about this and to continue asking questions. Be courageous and ask questions. And what we're about to do in moments time is we're about to gaze on the face of the one who loved you first. The one who loved you so intimately that he didn't count the cost, that he went to the cross and died for our sins. And you get a moment now to gaze into the loving face of Jesus in the beautiful moment we have in Eucharistic adoration, which will be coming up shortly. Wrestle with Jesus. Ask him those questions that are burning in your hearts. Turn to him and give him everything and say, Lord, help me see it more clearly. I don't want the garbage I'm being fed elsewhere. I want your truth because you are truth itself. And so in that spirit, Thank you, panelists. Thank you, everyone, for being with us. And I encourage all of you to keep the faith. God bless you.